I'm going to tell you about a woman I know. She's 47, I think. She's below normal in height and in breadth, and she lives in London. Her calling is both the humblest and the most independent of all. She doesn't answer to the name of a lady hope. Oh, no. When she answers the phone, all you hear is, this is the charwoman speaking, yes? Her face in repose is melancholy and a little vague. Her grey hair curls quite prettily over the temples, but her looks are spoilt by one protruding tooth, which her married daughter keeps begging her to have out, but she won't hear of it. A gypsy once told her that one day it's going to bring her luck, and she's sticking to it. Her clothes are soon described. Spotlessly clean, but all black and always black. I've seen her at two christenings in black. A shapeless little black toque on the top of her head, neat little black boots, one slightly over, a tiny fur tippet, and suddenly, quite unexpectedly, obviously a prize wedding present, a brooch with her Christian name flashing boldly across it. Alexandra. Any fine morning she's to be seen kneeling on the steps, doing them. The heels of the little boots tacking against each other as she leans to and fro. Once she's actually on her job, her vagueness vanishes. Whether it's polishing the lino or sorting out the ration books, she works swiftly, noiselessly, and with beautifully precise and cheerful movements. The work done, she gets up, and the melancholy sets in again. She doesn't talk much, and when she does, it's mostly superfluous. For instance, I've never yet known the air raid warning die away without her face coming slowly round the corner and her saying, with a look as calm as if she really meant to mispronounce the word that way, that was the serene. She's been told that her pronunciation is not correct and that nothing could be less serene than what she's describing, but no, it's like her tooth, she's sticking to it. She has two vices. One is singing while she's washing up in a very high, completely toneless voice, the most unsuitable songs. Some time ago it was, the night is young and you're so beautiful. Just lately, when one has become pretty well bomb conscious, her choice is even more unsuitable. Give a little whistle. Roll out the barrel she won't hear of, as it somehow spells drink to her and she's got a prejudice. The other vice is bomb stories, told in the most spiritless manner. It's the same ritual every time. I have to play up to her, but it's quite easy as it just means saying yes over and over again. Uh, you know the big stores, sir, next to the pillar box? Yes. You know the picture house next to the stores? Yes. You know the little garage that stands on the other corner? Yes. Well, it's gone. I said her face was melancholy and repose that when something really interests her, those eyes suddenly brighten and dart about like a bird, and she even talks. And that something which interests her isn't the war, which she ignores, and is only mentioned once, when somebody asked her if she didn't think that somebody's Austrian maid was the fifth colony. She looked more severe than I've ever seen her look, and the old tooth stuck out further than ever as she said, there's only one man that knows all those things, and that's Mr. Churchill, God bless him. You better drop him a line. No, there's only one interest in her life, and that's Reg. Reg is her only son, aged 15, an office boy in the city. It isn't that she praises him. Oh, on the contrary, she's always running him down. That lad will be the death of me. People say it's high spirits, but he's a bad boy. I gather that Reg's great accomplishment is combing his hair forward, raising one arm, and giving an impersonation of Hitler, which is apparently, war or no war, the talk of the stock exchange. He sounds to me rather a trying young chap. But he is her whole life. And the only time she's in any hurry to finish her work 
is on Reggie's fast day when she has to get home for his dinner. Only he'll bolt it all, she says, and off on that bike again. Sixty miles an hour, naughty boy. The serene's gone, sir. She told me once, in one of her gushes of confidence, that her little house over the river that she's lived in since she was married, when they still had gaps like, is going to be Reggie's when he grows up, for caution. She takes as much pride in it as in her ladies' and gentlemen's places. And in a Bible, in a tin box, at the bottom of a cupboard, tucked behind the dresser that her mother left her, there are 23 one-pound notes to start Reg in a bit of a shop when the war's over. But I'm telling you all this in the present, when some of it ought to be in the past. Because on Thursday morning, which it was late, for the first time since two years ago when it was discovered that she'd had pneumonia for 48 hours without anybody knowing, she was so late that when I left the house she still hadn't come in. I missed that steady, careful climb down the steps to the discreet little cough the bomb story and Reg's latest escapade. It seemed odd not to see those delicate vein hands scampering like mice after the dust under my desk with a little boot somewhere in the rear. When I got back about 12, though, I was relieved to hear the clatter of dishes in the sink. But no singing. The carpet had been hoovered and she'd given all the brass handles on the desk an extra polish. I called out, is everything all right? She called out, yes, and I thought no more about it. Then I realized suddenly that the noise of dishwashing had stopped. There wasn't a sound. I was mystified and walked into the kitchen. She was standing perfectly still in front of the sink, her hands wrist deep in the soapy water, looking out of the window. I spoke her name, and with a great and simple dignity, she turned her head. She looked at me, and I knew my presentiment had been right. She smiled. I noticed with a slight shock that her poor old tooth had gone, but it didn't spoil the smile somehow. You know, sir, she said, you know the way you teased me about my bomb stories? Well... I got my own bomb story now. I followed her eyes to the edge of the draining board, and there I saw the charred halves of two one-pound notes. She was obviously shaken, but no worse. What about Red, I said. Well, she said, looking out of the window, almost absent-mindedly, he's all right. As soon as he saw I was okay, he went off on his bike, the naughty thing, to help with another fire in the next street, and the wall fell on him, and he fell in a crater, and he's in the hospital with his legs broken, but he's all right. When I left, he got the nurses in stitches with the imitation of it, sir. He's all right. She was still looking out of the window, quite without movement, a single tear rolling into the wrinkles under one eye when slowly and unconsciously almost, she said two things which I don't think should be forgotten. She said, you know, sir, he's a very small boy for his age, but he's got spirit. And then came the only comment on the wall that I've ever heard her make. That Ickler, she said, thoughtfully, still looking out of the window, that Ickler, dropping bombs on Reg and me and such. You know, he's a bad loser. Well, after a lot of difficulty, I persuaded her to go back to Reg and her own affairs for the rest of the day. She finished washing up, dried her hands methodically on the roller towel, folded up her apron, put it carefully in its drawer, made up the laundry, perched the little toque on the top of her head, and set off. I watched that 
tiny, unobtrusive figure going its way along the street. She got to the fallen masonry strewn on the corner, stopped, gave one firm twitch to her fur tippet. The black boots proceeded to pick their way steadily through the rubble, and she was gone. The toughest, bravest little piper of us all.